Landgenoten, fellow South Africans, goeienaand, good evening. Ik groet u hier uit Tuinhuis, die historische gebouw wat voor geslachten als regeringssetel gediend het. Die jaar 1985, wat nou ten einde spoed, was in sommige opzichten een jaar van onstuimigheid. Op internationale gebied moest etelijke klein nazi's hulle onafhankelijkheid tegen militaire oormacht en georganiseerde terrorisme verdedig. Ook in ons eigen vaderland moest ons tegen ongeëvenaarde inmenging in ons binnenlandse aangeleentheden tegenstand bied. Terroristenmachten, wat uit vreemde oorden beheer en voorzien wordt, het ons land en zijn inwoners met geweld probeer oorweldig. Wanneer ons hier die machten bestrijden, worden daar schaamteloze dubbelstandaarden tegen Zuid-Afrika toegepast door landen wat beter behoort te weten. Ongelukkig moet ons erkennen dat hier die toedracht van zaken dikwijls door onnadenkende en onverantwoordelijke Zuid-Afrikaners zijn optreden en uitspraken aangevuurd. is. Dit is natuurlijk dat mensen in zulke omstandigheden tekens van vertwijfeling doen. Ik het begrip voor die bekommernissen van Zuid-Afrikaners uit alle bevolkingsgroepen. Ik is ook bewust van die innige verlangen bij die meerderheid Zuid-Afrikaners om vrede te genieten, zodat ons land voorspoed en ontwikkeling kan ondervind. Maar ten spijte van Tienslaa en strijkerblokken, het 1985 ook in andere opzichten voor ons allemaal reden tot blijdschap en dankbaarheid bezorg. Ons jubel voor die prachtige reens wat oor groot delen van ons land uitkomst gebring het. Ons het gebed en God het in sy almag die natuurkrachten aangewend om nieuwe leven aan mens en dier te schenk. Die nieuwe hoop op die platteland sy invloed strekt tot een dorp en stad. Ons landse mensen kan nog gevoed worden. Een voorrecht wat talle landen in Afrika niet geniet niet. Economische strijkelblokken was en is daar wel. Nochtans het zekere sectoren van onze economie bijzondere voordeel door uitvoer behaal. Dit het bijgedragen tot grotere inkomsten en wat die betalingsbalans betreft substantiële surplus help voorzien. Ons verwacht een groeikoers van meer dan 3% gedurende 1986. Maar ons besef dat het volgehouden zal moeten worden voordat het werkelijk groot en positieve resultaten zal leveren. Werkscheppen, opleiding en werkverschaffen blij een belangrijke taak voor hen doen. Zuid-Afrika's inflatiekoers is te hoog. De hoge productiviteit en besparingsbewustheid, zowel als die staatse begrotings- en salarisbeleid, kan ons die strijd tegen inflatie effectief voeren. Spanwerk en patriotische gezondheid is die verzekering tot succes. It gives me great pleasure to extend a word of deep appreciation to the millions of South Africans actively engaged in agriculture, our industries, trade, professional services, transport services and our mining sector. We appreciate the work done by those who maintain our country's administration and education services. Through personal visits to various parts of South Africa, I had ample experience of the success of our policy of regional development and decentralization bearing so much fruit in several underdeveloped areas of our region. The cooperation by self-governing and independent neighboring states contribute much to achieve this goal. All of us are witnessing the wisdom of this cooper cooperative policy through various instruments and institutions. When we consider the diversity 
of our economic activities. We can, we can understand the growing importance of our country as a regional power. I regret that attempts from various sources inside and outside our country are made to create chaos in some of our urban areas. I express a word of deep sympathy to those next of kin who lost family and friends as victims to the often barbaric attempts to make our country ungovernable. These conditions were exploited by some ruthless forces to create quite wrong perceptions of our country. But truth will prevail. There are sufficient people of goodwill in all our communities to ensure that we shall resolve our differences. There are also a vast number of South Africans who will honestly admit the extent of reform already achieved over a period of years. But the world at large still demands more of us and virtually overnight without contemplating the disastrous results for our country. All reasonable people know that the door is wide open to the achievement through negotiation of a political dispensation in South Africa which could satisfy the political aspirations of all the multicultural communities of South Africa. We have a duty which we shall not check to uphold Christian values and civilized norms in our country. These values and norms include language and cultural rights, the protection of private property, the right to an independent judiciary, and the freedom of religion and worship. These and many ele other elements of our peaceful coexistence must be upheld with determination and a strong national will. We commend our security forces for their disciplined and devoted efforts to maintain law and order and uphold the integrity of our borders. Without law and order and without the security of our borders, our state cannot be prosperous and peaceful. Peace must be protected. It must be protected by well-trained, determined men and women equipped to carry out their duty. This is not possible without sacrifice. Tien oor plugsgetrouwe lede van die Suid-Afrikaanse politie en die Suid-Afrikaanse weermag as ook die spoorwegpolitie betuig ek waardeer wanneer allemaal met hulle gewone dagtaak bezig is of rustig slaap is u dikwels bezig om met levensgevaar u dienst te verrig. Hartelijk dank vir u toebeide teen oor u families wat soveel moet opoffer, rig ons een hartelijke groet. Gedurende die afgelopen jaar was dit my voorrecht om met talle lede van ons culture, multiculturele bevolking in aanraking te kom. Ek het ook by verskillende geleentede kennis gemaakt met die mooi en belofte reke jeug van Suid-Afrika. Hier die landse jeug is een van die waarborge vir sy toekomst. Daar is genoegzame geleentede vir hulle om dier toewijding een toekomst te bouw. Ek het weer diep daarvan bewust geraak dat die individuele burgers en gemeenskappe van Suid-Afrika saamwerkende naas bestaan en een geest van goeie buurskap verkies. Die rijkdom van ons kulturele verscheidenheid moet ter wille van vrede behou en gehanda word. Suid-Afrika is nie een land van dooie uniformiteit nie. Door wederzijds respect kan ons dit echter een land van hoop maak. Die stappe wat ons gedurende 1985 geneem het om ons binnenlandse onderhandelingsproces te bevorder moet voortgezet word. Ons het die afgelopen jaar 
met die hervormingsproces gevorderd. Ik bedank alle leiders van verschillende bevolkingsgroepen wat daar aan deelgenomen het en nog wel deelnemen. Ons moet gedurende 1986 verder met de zin van verantwoordelijkheid en wederzijdse respect die oor mekaar optree. Ons mag niet wanhoop nie. Ons moet bouw. Ons moet met blijmoedigheid bouw. Ons het de koers gekies. Ons zoek naar oplossings voor ons onderlinge verhoudingen en een geest van christelijke gerechtigheid. Kom ons betreed die nieuwe jaar met waagmoed. Kom ons doen dit met geloof en ons kepper. Goeienacht. Goeienacht. Daar kom tijden in de geschiedenis van nazi's dat er keuze gemaakt moet worden. Dat is een onaangename alternatief. Die keuze tussen oorlog en een oneerbare vreesachtige vrede is zo'n so voorbeeld. Die besluit om een noodtoestand af te kondigen, zoals wat ik vandaag gedaan heb, vertegenwoordig ook zo'n so keuze. We are to talk to people who want constitutional change, but not. I am not prepared to talk to people who want revolutionary change. If Mandela were to Say he, that he, not, constitutional he does not want it. He has stated it all over and over again that he's in jail because he made certain, he took certain steps that uh, uh, which overstepped the mark as far as legislation was concerned. Meneer Bota's regering is gekenmerkt door the opbouw van a sterk weermacht, the vestiging van a South African krijgstuigvervaardiger, internationale sancties, the drie kamer parlement, twee noodtoestande en politieke opstande. Hy het vooral geroem op die slaankracht van die SA weermacht. We are in favor of signing non-aggression pacts with all our neighbors. That is an offer I am repeating this morning. But if countries allow themselves to be used as springboards by any forces against us, we shall hit necessarily back with force. Hij was ook bekend voor die zogenaamde Rubicon toespraak, waar tijdens aller weer verwacht is dat hij een grijpende hervormings in die land zou aankondigen. Nadat hij een gebreken gebleid om die Rubicon oor te steken, het grootskaalse disinvestering gevolg, terwijl onrust tegen die wit minderheidsregering scherp toegeneem het. Ek het gesê dat daar die discriminerende maatregels wat onnodig is, en wat slechte gevoel skep, moet verwijder worden. En ik heb gezegd dat hier die regering het al reeds bij daarvan verwijder. Maar ik is niet ten gunste daarvan. Van een systeem van verplichte integratie in Zuid-Afrika niet. Meneer Boot had niet gehuiver om zijn regeringse beleid te verdedigen. In the course of the fight of a country like South Africa against enemies who are trying everything in their power. To undermine the security of the state. Surely, like other countries in the world, South Africa is entitled to make use of secret methods to put its case right through the world. And do you deny that other countries also do it? Then you're a babe in the wood. Tijdens meneer Bota's bewind is die wet teen gemengde huwelike en die gehate pasboeken vir swart mense die sogenaamde dompas afgeskaf. Nadat meneer de Klerk die luiselspeel oorgeneem het, is meneer Mandela in 1990 vrygelaat wat die weggebaan het vir die eerste democratische verkiesing in 1994. Professor Gilumees sê meneer Bota was diep teleurgesteld oor die NPS' samenwerking met die ANC. Peter Willem Botha, DMS, commonly known as PW, and Di Groot Crocodile was the leader of South Africa from 1978 to 1989, serving as the last Prime Minister from 1978 to 1984 and the first Executive State President from 1984 to 1989. First elected to Parliament in 1948, 
Botha was an outspoken opponent of majority rule and international communism. However, his administration did make concessions towards political reform, whereas internal unrest saw widespread human rights abuses at the hands of the government. Botha resigned the leadership of the ruling National Party in February 1989 after suffering a stroke and six months later was coerced to leave the presidency as well. In F. W. de Klerk's 1992 referendum Botha campaigned for a no vote and denounced de Klerk's administration as irresponsible by opening the door to black majority rule. In early 1998, when Botha refused to testify at the Mandela government's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he was supported by the right-wing Conservative Party, which had earlier contested his rule as the official opposition. For his refusal, he was fined and given a suspended jail sentence for crimes against human rights. Shortly before his death in late 2006, he renewed his opposition towards egalitarian democracy in favor of a confederate system based upon the principles of separate development. Early life Peter Willem Botha was born on a farm in the Polro district of the Orange Free State province, the son of Afrikaner parents. His father, Peter Willem Botha Sr., fought as a commando against the British in the Second Boer War. His mother, Hendrina Christina Botha, was interned in a British concentration camp during the war. Botha initially attended the Polro School and matriculated from Vutrecker Secondary School in Bethlehem, South Africa. In 1934, he entered the Gray University College in Bloemfontein to study law, but left early at the age of 20 in order to pursue a career in politics. He began working for the National Party as a political organizer in the neighboring Cape Province. In the run-up to World War II, Botha joined the Oshwa Brandwag, a right-wing Afrikaner nationalist group which was sympathetic to the German Nazi Party. However, with Allied victory looming in Europe, Botha condemned the Oshwa Brandwag and changed his ideological allegiance to Christian nationalism instead. In 1943, Botha married Anna Elizabeth Russell. The couple had two sons and three daughters. Parliamentary career At age 30, Botha was elected head of the National Party Youth in 1946, and two years later won a race for the House of Assembly as representative of George in the Southern Cape Province in the general election which saw the beginning of the National Party's 46-year tenure in power. In 1958 Botha was appointed Deputy Minister of Internal Affairs by Hendrik Verwood, and in 1961 advanced to Minister of Coloured Affairs. He was appointed Minister for Defence by Verwood's successor B. J. Vista, upon Verwood's murder, in 1966. Under his 14 years as its leader, the South African Defence Force reached a zenith, at times consuming 20% of the national budget, compared to 1,3% in 2009, and was involved in the South African border war. When Vista resigned following allegations of his involvement in the Muldergate scandal in 1978, Botha was elected as his successor by the National Party Caucus, besting the electorate's favourite, 45 year old Foreign Minister Pick Botha. In the final internal ballot, he beat Connie Mulder, the scandal's namesake, in a 78 to Euro 72 vote. Though generally considered a conservative, Botha was also seen as far more pragmatic than his predecessor. He was keen to promote constitutional reform, and hoped to implement a form of federal system in South Africa that would allow for greater self rule for black homelands, while still retaining the supremacy of a white central government and foremost expand the rights of coloreds and Asians in order to widen support for the government. Upon enacting the reforms, he remarked in the House of Assembly, We must adapt or die. On becoming head of the government, Botha retained the defense portfolio until October 1980, when he appointed Chief of the South African Defense Force, General Magnus Mallon, his successor. From his ascension to the cabinet, Botha pursued an ambitious military policy designed to increase South Africa's military capability. He sought to improve relations with the West a Euro especially the United States a Euro, but with mixed results. He argued that the preservation of the apartheid government, though unpopular, was crucial to stemming the tide of African communism, which had made inroads into neighboring Angola and Mozambique after these two former Portuguese colonies obtained independence. As Prime Minister and later State President, 
His greatest parliamentary opponents were Harry Schwartz and Helen Sussman of the Progressive Federal Party until 1987, when his former cabinet colleague Andres Trianites New Conservative Party became the official opposition on a strictly anti-concessionist agenda. In 1977, as Minister of Defense he began a secret nuclear weapons program, which culminated in the production of six nuclear bombs destroyed only in the early 1990s. He remained steadfast in South Africa's administration of the neighboring territory Southwest Africa, particularly while there was a presence of Cuban troops in Angola to the north. Botha was responsible for introducing the notorious Police Counterinsurgency Unit, COVOIT. He was also instrumental in building the South African Defense Forces' strength, adding momentum to establishing units such as 32 Battalion. South African intervention in support of the rebel UNITA movement in the Angolan Civil War continued until the late 1980s, terminating with the Tripartite Accord. To maintain the nation's military strength, a very strict draft was implemented to enforce compulsory military service for white South African men. State President, in 1983 both the proposed a new constitution, which was then put to a vote of the white population. Though it did not implement a federal system, it created two new houses of parliament alongside the existing, white-only House of Assembly a Euro one for coloreds and one for Indians. The three chambers of the new tricameral parliament had sole jurisdiction over matters related to their respective communities. Legislation affecting general affairs, such as foreign policy and race relations, had to pass all three chambers after consideration by joint standing committees. The plan included no chamber or system of representation for the black majority. Each black ethno-linguistic group was allocated a homeland which would initially be a semi-autonomous area. However, blacks were legally considered citizens of the Bantustans, not of South Africa, and were expected to exercise their political rights there. Bantustans were expected to gradually move towards a greater state of independence with sovereign nation status being the final goal. During both as tenure Siske, both Futitswana and Venda all achieved nominal nationhood. These new countries set up within the borders of South Africa never gained international recognition. The new constitution also changed the executive branch, abolishing the post of prime minister. Instead, that post's powers were transferred to the state president, which was converted into an executive post with sweeping powers. He was elected by an electoral college whose members were elected by the three chambers of the parliament. The president and cabinet had sole jurisdiction over general affairs. Disputes between the three chambers regarding general affairs were resolved by the president's council, composed of members from the three chambers and members directly appointed by the president. In practice, the composition of the President's Council and the Electoral College made it impossible for the colored and Indian chambers to outvote the White Chamber even if they voted as a bloc. Thus, the real power remained in white hands seguro, and in practice, in the hands of both as national party. Though the new constitution was criticized by the black majority for failing to grant them any formal role in government, Many international commentators praised it as a first step in what was assumed to be a series of reforms. On September 14, 1984, Botha was elected as the first state president under the newly approved constitution. Implementing the presidential system was seen as a key step in consolidating Botha's personal power. In previous years he had succeeded in getting a number of strict laws that limited freedom of speech through parliament and thus suppressed criticism of government decisions. In many Western countries, such as the United States, the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth there was much debate over the imposition of economic sanctions in order to weaken both and undermine the white regime. By the late 1980s a euro as foreign investment in South Africa declined a euro disinvestment began to have a serious effect on the nation's economy. Apartheid government, in superficial ways, both as application of the apartheid system was less repressive than that of his predecessors. He legalized interracial marriage and miscegenation, both completely banned since the late 1940s. The constitutional prohibition on multiracial political parties was lifted. He also relaxed the Group Areas Act, which barred non-whites from living in certain areas. In 1988, a new law created open group areas, 
or racially mixed neighborhoods. But these neighborhoods had to receive a government permit, and had to have the support of the local whites immediately concerned, and had to be a high-class neighborhood in the major cities typically in order to receive the permit. In 1983, the above constitutional reforms granted limited political rights to coloreds and Indians. Botha also became the first South African government leader to authorize contacts with Nelson Mandela, the imprisoned leader of the African National Congress. However, in the face of rising discontent and violence, Botha refused to cede political power to blacks and imposed greater security measures against anti-apartheid activists. Botha also refused to negotiate with the ANC. In 1985, Botha delivered the Rubicon speech which was a policy address in which he refused to give in to demands by the black population, including the release of Mandela. Botha's defiance of international opinion further isolated South Africa, leading to economic sanctions and a rapid decline in the value of the rand. The following year, when the U.S. introduced the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act, Botha declared a nationwide state of emergency. He is famously quoted during this time as saying, this uprising will bring out the beast in us. As economic and diplomatic actions against South Africa increased, civil unrest spread amongst the black population, supported by the ANC and neighboring black majority governments. On May 16, 1986, both the publicly warned neighboring states against engaging in unsolicited interference in South Africa's affairs. Four days later, both an ordered airstrikes against selected targets in Lusaka, Harare, and Gaboran, including the offices of exiled ANC activists. Both are charged that these raids were just a first installment, and showed that South Africa has the capacity and the will to break the African National Congress. In spite of the concessions made by Botha, the apartheid years under his leadership were by far the most brutal. Thousands were detained without trial during Botha's presidency, while others were tortured and killed. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission found Botha responsible for gross violations of human rights. He was also found to have directly authorized unlawful activity which included killing. However, Botha refused to apologize for apartheid. In a 2006 interview to mark his 90th birthday, he suggested that he had no regrets about the way he had run the country. He denied, however, that he had ever considered black South Africans to be in any way inferior to whites, but conceded that some whites did hold that view. He also claimed that the apartheid policies were inherited from the British colonial administration in the Eastern Cape and Natal province, implying that he considered them something he and his government had followed by default. Resignation, State President Botha's loss of influence can be directly attributed to decisions taken at the Ronald reagan mikhail Gorbachev summit at the leaders of the United States and the Soviet Union in Moscow that paved the way to resolving the problem of Namibia which, according to Foreign Minister Pick Botha, was destabilizing the region and seriously complicating the major issue which South Africa itself would shortly have to face. Soviet military aid would cease and Cuban troops be withdrawn from Angola as soon as South Africa complied with UN Security Council Resolution 435 by relinquishing control of Namibia and allowing UN supervised elections there. The tripartite agreement, which gave effect to the Reagan Gorbachev summit decisions, was signed at UN headquarters in New York on December 22, 1988, by representatives of Angola, Cuba, and South Africa. On January 18, 1989, Botha suffered a mild stroke which prevented him from attending a meeting with Namibian political leaders on January 20, 1989. Botha's place was taken by acting president, J. Christian Hunes. On February 2, 1989, Botha resigned as leader of the National Party anticipating his nominee a Euro finance minister Baron Du Plessis a Euro would succeed him. Instead, the NP's parliamentary caucus selected as leader Education Minister F. W. de Klerk, who moved quickly to consolidate his position within the party. In March 1989, the NP elected de Klerk as state president but both are refused to resign, saying in a television address that the constitution entitled him to remain in office until March 1990 and that he was even considering running for another five-year term. Following a series of acrimonious meetings in Cape Town, 
and five days after UNSCR 435 was implemented in Namibia on April 1, 1989, Botha and de Klerk reached a compromise. Botha would retire after the parliamentary elections in September, allowing de Klerk to take over as president. However, Botha resigned from the state presidency abruptly on August 14, 1989 complaining that he had not been consulted by de Klerk over his scheduled visit to see President Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia. The ANC is enjoying the protection of President Kaunda and is planning insurgency activities against South Africa from Lusaka, Botha declared on nationwide television. He said he had asked the cabinet what reason he should give the public for abruptly leaving office. They replied I could use my health as an excuse. To this, I replied that I am not prepared to leave on a lie. It is evident to me that after all these years of my best efforts for the National Party and for the government of this country, as well as the security of our country, I am being ignored by ministers serving in my cabinet. De Klerk was sworn in as acting state president on August 14, 1989 and the following month was nominated by the Electoral College to succeed Botha in a five-year term as state president. Within months of the collapse of the Berlin Wall, de Klerk had announced the legalization of anti-apartheid groups a euro including the African National Congress a euro, and the release of Nelson Mandela. De Klerk's rule saw the dismantling of the apartheid system and negotiations that eventually led to South Africa's first racially inclusive democratic elections on April 27, 1994. In a statement on the death of former State President P. W. Botha in 2006, de Klerk said, Personally, my relationship with P. W. Botha was often strained. I did not like his overbearing leadership style and was opposed to the intrusion of the State Security Council system into virtually every facet of government. After I became leader of the National Party in February 1989 I did my best to ensure that P. W. Botha would be able to end his term as president with full dignity and decorum. Unfortunately, this was not to be. Retirement, Botha and his wife Elise retired to their home, Dianka in the town of Wilderness, close to the city of George and located on the Indian Ocean coast of the Western Cape. His wife Elise died in 1997, and he later married Barbara Robertson, a legal secretary 25 years his junior, on June 22, 1998. Both are remained largely out of sight of the media and it was widely believed that he remained opposed to many of F. W. de Klerk's reforms. Botha refused to testify at the new government's Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Exposing Apartheid-era Crimes, which was chaired by his cultural and political nemesis, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The TRC found that he had ordered the bombing of the South African Council of Churches headquarters in Johannesburg. In August 1998 he was fined and given a suspended jail sentence for his refusal to testify in relation to human rights violations and the violence sanctioned by the State Security Council which he, as president until 1989, had directed. In June 1999 Botha successfully appealed to the High Court against his conviction and sentence. The court found that the notice served on Botha to appear before the commission was technically invalid. Death. Botha died of a heart attack at his home in Wilderness on Tuesday, 31 October 2006, aged 90. His death was met with magnanimity by many of his former opponents. Former President Nelson Mandela was reported as saying while to many Mr. Botha will remain a symbol of apartheid, we also remember him for the steps he took to pave the way towards the eventual peacefully negotiated settlement in our country. President Thabo Mbeki announced that flags would be flown at half-staff, to mark the death of a former head of state. The offer of a state funeral was declined by Botha's family, and a private funeral was held on November 8 in the town of George where Botha was buried. Mbeki, who had lost a brother, a son and a cousin during apartheid, attended the funeral. References Further reading, Botha's last interview before he died, The Mandela Document Dated prior to Mandela's release, Fighter and Reformer, Extracts from the Speeches of P. W. Botha, compiled by J. 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 Skulls, published, Bureau for Information, Pretoria, 1989, The Life and Times of P. W. Botha Euro IOL, P. W. Tambo Partners in Peace Euro News 24, He Was My Bread and Botha Euro Mail and Guardian, Zuma on P. W. 
he saw the need for change a Euro Mail and Guardian, Fabo Mbeki on PW a Euro. We believe in a system of private initiative and we will protect it as far as it is humanly possible. I want to make it perfectly clear that neither the international community at large nor any particular state will dictate to us what the contents of our political program should be. The world must take note and never forget that we are not a nation of weaklings. We do not desire it and we do not seek it, but if we are forced to go it alone, then so be it. The disgraceful facts are as follows. The United States Embassy has until now been permitted to maintain an aircraft in South Africa for the use of the ambassador on certain conditions in the execution of his official duties. This aircraft was converted for use as a spy plane by the installation of an aerial survey camera under the seat of the co-pilot. In flight, a device enabled the camera to take photographs of the earth below. Photographs in our possession reveal that the embassy aircraft was engaged in a systematic program of photography of vast areas of South Africa, including some of our most sensitive installations. The Foreign Minister has informed United States Ambassador that in the light of the use to which the Embassy aircraft has been put, the privilege of maintaining it in South Africa is summarily terminated. It is to be removed as soon as South African technicians can be satisfied that all photographic equipment has been removed from it to prevent further photography on its outward flight. The South African government has expressed its profound shock and dismay to the United States government at this reprehensible act by representatives of a country with which South Africa maintains diplomatic relations. I would add that I am bitterly distressed to learn how South African hospitality has been abused. Mr. Boerter, the suspicion in certain quarters is that the government would want to cover up if it can. What assurances and proof can you give that this will not be the case? The fact that the government appointed a judicial commission to deal with this matter is, to my mind, proof enough, proof enough that we won't cover up anything. I said in public, and I repeat it, that the interests of the state, and especially the security interests of the state, will be kept in mind. But it is for the Commission to make their recommendations, and we will appear before Parliament, and we will then uh, tell Parliament what the attitude of the government is in the light of the evidence properly weighed but not one-sided evidence published in newspapers.
We lay no claim to being a perfect society. After all, which country on the globe can lay such claim? We are a young, albeit stable country. Constitutional autonomy dates back but a few decades when the fetters of rule from abroad were cast off. And yet, in those few decades we have made remarkable progress towards extending peace, prosperity, and opportunity to all our population communities. We are our very meaningful achievements, our peaceful aspirations, and our blueprints for safe and secure future. And the secure future are not considered by potential allies, why are representatives from Southern Africa, terrorist movements fated and fawned upon in capitals of the world where they misrepresent facts and preach bloodshed, whilst the represent representatives from established governments have to put up with hostility and suspicion? Why are fact, logic and our good faith disregarded in favour of the spurious claims of minority and unrepresentative groups of dissidents? These questions and others make it difficult for us to come to terms with the attitudes displayed towards our country. If economic sanctions are applied against us, we shall not only fight against it, but we shall take steps which will demonstrate the folly of sanctions against the Republic of South Africa. And it will be folly. And I hope that reason will prevail in international affairs. I don't see any reason why members of the free world should have confrontation with each other. We are prepared to listen to other people's <coughs> and ideas. But surely, we're not going to abdicate We are acting from a position of strength. I thank you for listening to me. And I thank you once again for the opportunity to meet you.
Commissioner has agreed to answer some questions. I'm not going to the Truth Commission. I am not going to repent. I am not going to ask for favors. What I did, I did for my country. Ladies and gentlemen, just um, one aspect. Mr. Goethe is going to uh, everybody here. So um, what I will do is, is I will put the copies here. I've also met. Well, um, Can I just Net zoals ik ook die bereid om verschoning te vragen voor die wettige optredens van mijn regering en zijn strijd om die aanslag wat tegen ons staatsbestel gemak was, die hoeft te bieden niet. Of die beginsel van vreedzame naastbestaan van al ons mensen, waarin ik gegloord en wat ik in die hoogste belang van Zuid-Afrika geacht heb en nog acht. In order to further the process of reform, I have suggested on the 25th of January this year that leaders of black communities have to be involved in inquiries that concern the position of those communities. In the course of the year, various planned reform steps with regard to black communities were envisaged. To summarize, it means that the government is committed to the principle of a united South Africa, joint citizenship and franchise for all within structures chosen for South Africa by South Africans. Naturally, these viewpoints do not mean that we will put up stumbling blocks for self-governing areas that prefer to become independent states while at the same time cooperating with us on matters of common concern. And this also does not exclude the necessity of the existence of regional authorities, provincial structures, and jurisdiction territories for local authorities. The reports thus far submitted by the President's Council to the government and myself as advice concern all the inhabitants of South Africa. This includes the black communities. In this regard, opportunities already exist for members of black communities to make inputs at the highest level. Opportunities they indeed already utilize while retaining their rights as different cultural entities. Members of black communities are, however, not formally involved in the process of consultation of the President's Council. For this reason, I expressed the opinion on the 30th of September this year that the President's Council should perhaps be restructured. I conceded that the need might exist among leaders of black communities for further forms of negotiation. This can be achieved by participating in inquiries and making recommendations to me as head of state within the President's Council. I then stated that I am prepared to reconsider the structuring and the functions of the President's Council to make provision for their participation. I think the time has come to take a good look at the composition and the functions of the President's Council in this regard. If the President's Council would like to submit 
Any suggestions or advice concerning this possibility to me, I would welcome it. I have earlier referred to people within and outside the country who are attempting to put a spoke in the wheel of the process of reform. I have also referred to the fact that the attacks on South Africa are gaining impetus. Again, I would like to ask the question, why is it that the campaign to destroy orderly reform is becoming most severe exactly when the foundations and guidelines for constitutional development in South Africa are being laid? It seems to me that there can only be one answer. There are people in South Africa and outside the country for whom orderly reform is a thorn in the side and extremely dangerous. They are endangered by, endangered by it because what they want to do with this country will not be done if the basis of democracy is broadened in an orderly manner. It poses a threat to them because an orderly and peaceful community leaves no space or opportunity for powers addicts to in intimidate people. They run a risk when sudden Africa's peoples and nations form a bastion against intervention by forces not well disposed towards us. I believe that the government's sustained steps of reform over the past years are exposing the sinister attempts of these people. We are lifting the veil on the real motives of these people with South Africa that are hidden behind a front of pious talks of morality. That is why we are experiencing increasing attempts to drive a wedge between those who find their cultural home in South Africa, whose roots are planted deep in the soil of this African land and who, in the long course of history, found a livelihood here. The lessons of Africa taught us that the way to welfare and peace indicated by foreign interests and powers were quite often the downhill road to ruin. We must not allow the same to happen in this lovely country of ours. The President's Council has an important part to play in this regard. I thank you for the work you have done thus far. But I beg you, let us think positively, let us act constructively, and let us build our future demands, we, our future demands it. In the past, momentous decisions, like the development of the Orange River system, Sasol, and the Kubach nuclear power station, were proof of this positive approach to the development of our country. It now gives me great pleasure to inform you that the government has decided to go ahead with the initial phases of the Mossel Bay gas extraction and conversion project as part of its overall synthetic fuels project. The decision was taken after comprehensive studies proved that the gas reserves are of an economic exploitable quality and quantity. These projects can be established on a financially viable basis. The capital cost would be in the region of approximately 3,500 million rand. It will be financed without resorting to extensive loans. The financing of these projects will come to a large extent from available resources of the Central Energy Fund. It will further be supported by anticipated private sector participation. We have calculated that approximately some 10,000 new job opportunities will be created during the peak of the construction phase. This figure could be doubled if the satellite industries are taken into account. The job opportunities 
will come in many instances in completely new technological spheres. There is development to be done, new skills to be mastered, and a demand to rise to new heights of achievement. Further details of this and other challenging projects will, which will grant the private sector further opportunities of becoming involved in the government's synthetic fuels project will be announced by the Minister of Mineral and Energy Affairs at the appropriate time in the near future. I trust that these imaginative pro projects will afford South Africans the opportunity to yet once again demonstrate the spirit which made this country the industrial giant of Africa. The time for initiative and creativity is again with us. I trust that these projects and the vigor with which the private and public sectors will meet these ex exciting technological challenges will dramatically illustrate the commitment of all South Africans to the future. It should also act to demonstrate the government's enthusiasm and dedication to create a prosperous South Africa for all our peoples. Therefore, let us be positive. Let us build. I thank you. I'm asking this not just as a polite routine question, but back in 1989, after you had suffered a minor stroke, your cabinet requested that you resign for reasons of health, they said. Well, some 15 years later, many clods have fallen on many coffins in many cemeteries, and here you still are. Yes, uh, by the grace of God, I'm still around. And how are you feeling? No, I don't feel bad, and I, 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 I'm still quite good health, and uh, I'm looking forward for the rest of the life to, to, to continue uh, with my activities. Did you feel then and now that you were unfairly treated by the cabinet? And were there ulterior motives behind persuading you to resign? I read somewhere that you had said to them that you at least had a certificate proving your health while they did not. And you wondered how many of them had pills in their pockets. So, Mr. Boerter, was there something sinister behind it all? After the, 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 the so-called light stroke, I, in, I requested the man in Pretoria, Dr. Meiberg, he was the head of the Medical Institute. I requested him to come down here to wilderness with his instruments and come and examine me. And uh, after he stayed here for two days, he said, I don't agree with the light stroke idea. Go on with your work, you're in good health. I stayed then in Cape Town in Rondebosch as president and only in 19, uh, August of 1989 did the showdown take place at that specific uh, cabinet meeting. So why did the cabinet meeting take place? Was there something sinister behind it all? According to those minutes, Mr. de Klerk and a few other members of the cabinet were, co were cooperating with each other to tell me that they think I must go. You think Mr. de Klerk at that stage had the ambition to become the next president? I think so. I think so. During a break in the interview, Mr. Buerta showed us some of his memorabilia. The cannon was a gift from the Defence Force in commemoration of the 14 years he spent as Minister of Defence. He regarded those years as the best in his life and was extremely proud of the strength of the Defence Force. Uh, we were respected by the Defence Forces of France, Great Britain, 
uh, and uh, even Israel, and Israel has a good defense force. Why did you think we needed such an incredibly strong defense force? Uh, to a certain extent, we, we, we introduced national service to train young men in various directions of life. And secondly, we had to protect our borders and, uh, from terrorism. And thirdly, the Defense Force uh, inspired uh, the, the nation as a whole. There are those who say that the need for a strong defense force had to do with P.W. Bertal's obsession with what he called the total onslaught against South Africa. So I asked him how serious the onslaught actually was. It wasn't an obsession on my part. I had advice by several senior officers in the defense force and strategists in South Africa and that they advised me that taking into account the actions of Russia and Cuba and some of the Western nations, uh, there was an onslaught against Southern Africa, not only South Africa, but Southern Africa, including Rhodesia and the Portuguese territories. And uh, that total onslaught had to be dealt with by way of uh, opposition on our part or positive actions to try and convince people that this onslaught is dangerous. We invaded Angola in support of Dr. Jonas Savimbi. Was that necessary? We had an agreement on military intelligence part was uh, with the CIA that we would mine, they would mine Luanda Harbor while we helped the Vimbi to attack the forces, the, the MPLA forces in Luanda. Well, there the actual cooperation took place. And eventually, with things uh, rapidly moving from one day to the other, the American Congress decided that President Ford would not be allowed to mine further the Luanda Harbor. Then the Cubans were brought in by Russia. And uh, we fought the, the Cubans. Mr. Berta, did we not eventually actually drop Savimbi? I remember former Foreign Minister Pick Berta promising Savimbi at a huge rally in Jamba, and only after he had asked me to switch off my television cameras that South Africa would support UNITA all the way into Luanda. That never happened, and why not? What happened was that uh, the decision of the American Congress. The American Congress <coughs> took that fatal decision to prohibit President Ford to carry out his promises. Kissinger played a role in the whole affair. And uh, afterwards, Dr. Kissinger came to Pretoria and he uh, he uh, apologized to me for not having carried out his promises. Did he explain why they, they Well, he said remade. the Congress decided that way. I said, well, you left us in a ledge. Don't hide behind the Congress. You know that you didn't carry out your promise. And then we decided to withdraw <coughs> our forces southwards and we then advised the Mumbi to fight guerrilla warfare. In his book on extracts from P.W. Buerta's speeches, 
Scholz quotes a 1988 address to the House of Assembly in which Mr. Boerter says, It is unfortunate that Americans have one set of rules for themselves and another for other people. In fact, back in 1979, he also lambasted the West, declaring, Is it not a fact that of the concept the West as we knew it in the past, as countries that were characterized by honorable government and a fixed course of international affairs, almost nothing remains? There is no counter strategy. There is a shuffling and a stumbling from one blunder to the next. The West is being ousted from all over the globe. A former Rhodesia, while compiling a documentary on that country, I was told by officers that the South African Defence Force in particular was starving Rhodesia of ammunition and weaponry. In fact, a former cabinet minister of Rhodesia, Mr. Jack Musset, he said that South Africa had been strangling Rhodesia. I tried to maintain good official relations with Rhodesia. And Ian Smith makes mention of it in his book, The Great Betrayal, in which he uh, pointed out how Rhodesia was betrayed by other forces. But I maintained, to a certain extent, good relations with them. I even paid an official visit to Rhodesia. And Smith, on occasion, came down here. But uh, to say that we starved them, I think is a bit of an exaggeration. But did we stop supplying them with weaponry and other supplies, for instance? You must remember that stage, we were under pressure too, and heavy pressure. On the issue of separate development or apartheid, after the assassination of Dr. Favut in 1966, even the Sunday Times editorialized that the concept of the Bantu homelands was one of the great legacies Dr. Favut has left his country. Did you ever really believe that the country's black people and the international community would accept the idea of black homelands spread around South Africa? Provided we tried to convince them that they must accept it and cooperate with us in the fields of agriculture and uh, industrial development within those homelands, so I really believed that we could uh, gradually continue uh, making it possible for them to economically advance forward. Why did it not eventually transpire then? It was a question that we tried to follow the policy of uh, uh, winning the hearts and minds of people. Uh, but on the other hand, the pressure and the total onslaught made it very difficult for them. You must remember at that stage terrorism took place in South Africa with the bombs in Pretoria and uh, terrorists entered uh, across our borders and uh, they killed people, they even burned tires in, in Johannesburg streets to, to, to block the traffic and we had to counter that with strong measures. Further to the violence issue, we quote now from the so-called Mandela document, which was presented to P.W. Boerta before their meeting in July 1989. The organization, the ANC, has no vested interest in violence, but we consider the armed struggle a legitimate form of self-defense against a morally repugnant system of government which will not allow even peaceful forms of protest. Mr. Boerta, a hypothetical question, but it has to be asked. What do you think South Africa would have looked like today had there been black majority rule in the country since 1948 when the National Party came into power or even since the 1960s, 
when much of Africa was decolonized? I think by this time we should have been, we would have been in, in, in the drain already. Why do you say that? Because the forces of evil gradually took over in Africa, took over in Mozambique, took over in Angola, took over in Rhodesia, and the pressure against South Africa on the East Front and the West Front. That pressure was continually growing. And the result was the propaganda uh, among the black people, trying to convince them that everything was rosy in the garden for them if they just supported the idea of one man, one vote. That was a miserable situation that we found ourselves in. Miserable indeed. Mr. Mandela wrote that the National Party and its Western friends regarded majority rule as a disaster to be avoided at all costs. And he then commented, Yet majority rule and internal peace are like the two sides of a single coin. And white South Africa simply has to accept that there will never be peace and stability in this country until the principle is fully applied. Many would say that during those years, black people were regarded as inferior to whites. I mean, even the expression subhuman is used. Do you think whites ever regarded black people in that light? Uh, to a certain extent, it's true that uh, that propaganda was made. And uh, from certain parts of our media, that was a part of the, of, the, of the propaganda. From outside, it was part of the propaganda. From the uh, United Nations uh, anti-South African actions, that was the idea behind driving them. But uh, I never looked at the people in this sense of inferior, because many black people I repeat, many black people and coloreds cooperated uh, positively with government uh, uh, policies. But if we didn't regard them as inferior, I'm saying we as whites. We wouldn't what, have what? we wouldn't have taken in into the industrial development areas if if they were inferior. But, but we denied them so many things. I mean, they couldn't eat in the same restaurants, we had job reservation, they couldn't vote or anything. I mean, is that not the way you treat a person that's inferior? You must remember one thing. We did not originate that uh, sense or that uh, uh, part of the so-called apartheid policy. This very policy started in Lord Milner's time, in Cecil Rhodes' time, and in the time of the British governors of the Eastern Province and Natal. So it's a very, very old, old policy that existed. We, we, we didn't invite it. No, but we were happy to perpetuate it because. I mean, we, we, were extent, actually yes. racist. we were actually racists at heart at that stage as well, isn't it? Yes, so? some of our people were, and uh, some of them are still. Moving on now, actually, and tying in with us, that famous Rubicon speech of yours in 1985. Speculation was rife at the time that you would announce major changes and even a commitment to the concept of a unitary state. That's right, yeah. but that was not true. And the Rubicon, the word Rubicon, was only one word in the whole speech. But suddenly it became the Rubicon speech. Speculation was rife at the time that you would announce major changes and even a commitment to the concept of a unitary state. That's right. Yeah. But that was not true. And the Rubicon, the word Rubicon, was only one word in the whole speech. But suddenly it became the Rubicon speech. That wasn't the case. 
So, in, in other words, you didn't feel the time was ripe then for such major changes to be made? I had in my mind, broadly speaking, to gradually bring in a system of government on the basis of confederation. And I said so. I said so in Parliament. I advocated a system of confederation in South Africa and confederal cooperation in Southern Africa. Again, looking at that 90, uh, 89 cabinet meeting, at its conclusion, Mr. de Klerk stated that it would be a wrong deduction to state that cabinet ministers had become soft about the ANC and that they were being led by the nose by anyone wishing to promote the interests of the ANC. Those are the words of Mr. de Klerk. Did he keep that pledge, do you think, or did he indeed turn soft? I think they weakened. I think they weakened, and I foretold it. I said to them, I feel sorry for you, because the horses you are taking in control are wild horses, and you'll, you will find that eventually they will harm you. And I was prophesying the correct thing. Only about a month earlier in his document, Mr. Mandela called for an ANC government meeting to discuss a negotiated settlement and wrote. Two central issues will have to be addressed at such a meeting. Firstly, the demand for majority rule in a unitary state. Secondly, the concern of white South Africans over this demand, as well as the insistence of whites on structural guarantees that majority rule will not mean domination. Such reconciliation will be achieved only if both parties are willing to compromise. Some people, they feared a bloodbath, Mr. Berta, after the 1994 election. Did you share those fears? Uh, no, not exactly. Uh, South Africa, right through its history, was a country where violence took place from time to time. I, I didn't I didn't look at, at that stage uh, in the sense that I expected a bloodbath, mm -hmm. but violence was a, possi was a possibility. But we had strong security forces, we had a strong defense force, we had a really well-trained police force. Did you ever during your presidency and before, ever think that the ANC would take over the rule of this country? You know, when Mr. Pak Buerta mentioned the possibility of a, of a black president, I think a huge number of whites thought, what nonsense is that? The immediate reaction was that the then leader of the National Party in Transvaal, Mr. de Tlaik, and the then Minister of Constitutional Government, Mr. Hines, approached me and they complained against the actions taken by the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. I called the three together and after having had a proper discussion, Mr. Buddha wrote me a letter in which he admitted that he didn't actually advocate party policy. And I stated that in Parliament. Now I hear that I repudiated him. That is not true. What I said was I gave the facts of the two colleagues who complained about his action. Why was the country then forced into that road of one man, one vote? And that's it? Yes, that was uh, uh, actually after I left. I withstood it. I said so in Parliament that I'm not in favour of one man, one vote. But under a confederal system, you could accept the principle of one man, one vote for that community 
or that uh, special part of the Confederation. Well, then why did Mr. de Klerk and company decide on a one-man, one-vote election? I mean, is it then simply they didn't want to stay in power through the barrel of a gun or what? What was their Look, thinking? Uh, I had a personal discussion with him on this matter. And it was taped in this very house. And I told him that he became weak as against the forces trying to break South Africa. I looked on the television where he addressed a press conference in Washington and the previous President Bush, the father of the present President Bush, stood next to him. And there he announced that he would stand for irreversible policy. That very night I looked at television and I said to people sitting with me, there is the beginning of the end. Do you think it was the beginning of the end, Mr. Berta, or was it simply the um, end of a new beginning for the country via a new constitution, the 94 elections? Wasn't it actually inevitable, given all the pressures? No, I think we should have gone on with our positive uh, way of thinking and trying to introduce the European system of government and not, and, and, and not, the, government, not the American system. At two national party meetings in 1980, P.W. Boerta was emphatic about his visions for South Africa. We must find a solution not only in a constellation of states, but eventually in a form of confederation of independent states, as far as our neighbors are concerned. For as long as I am leader of the National Party, there will not be one man, one vote in Parliament, and there will not be one man, one vote in a federal Parliament. I do not believe that that would be in the interests of the whites, nor do I believe that it would be in the interests of the blacks, for from such a situation, blood and strife in South Africa will surely flow. It did not work anywhere else in Africa. You either got dictatorship, or you got a one-party state or you got the destruction of the people. Affirmative action. I'm looking now at more or less the um, latest issues. And the offshoots such as black economic empowerment, transformation and so on. Now they are designed to assist the previously disadvantaged. How do you view these policies? I think it's a bad form of our apartheid. A bad form. And it's a miserable form. Uh, it drives know-how out of the country. And it drives valuable people to look for jobs in other countries. And it, it's a pity. It's a pity. Those people should not have left South Africa. They should have stayed here and given the opportunity with their uh, talents to help developing the country, create jobs, and uh, create a strong economy. Well, what can be done, do you think, then, to uplift the previously disadvantaged black people? Yes, that is a very important question. I'm looking sometimes, I dry, uh, when we drive into George, and I see the young black people coming from the homelands, sitting here in uh, some sort of housing schemes without work. I think a proper reversal of policies should take place. A proper reversal to see what can be done to create work opportunities. In 1986, Mr. Boerta told the House of Assembly, 
we can only get somewhere if the first world economy in this country is allowed to adopt a policy of upliftment towards the third world economy. Secondly, we can only get somewhere if the white leadership is not undermined. And we can only get somewhere if the safety of the whites in South Africa is not undermined. Pessimists in South Africa and elsewhere, they are warning that we may be heading for a Zimbabwe type situation. Are you more optimistic? No. I, I want to say this. Sometimes I wonder whether the pessimists are not right. And uh, now what's going to happen to Zimbabwe, I can't say. Uh, all I know is that uh, there's a lack of proper f development there. They admit it themselves. So it's not out of the question that South Africa could eventually land there. Because there is real corruption in South Africa. And uh, I had a black minister here from one of the homelands a while ago. And he asked me, what do I think of the South African situation? And I said to him, you know, there's only one type of direction where you use where you start from the top to create, and that is a grave. While the best form of development is to start at the bottom. And I still believe we must start at the bottom, create jobs, create opportunities. This story of affirmative action should be abolished. This black empowerment should be abolished. It should be abolished as soon as possible. And cooperation should take place. Corruption, Mr. Berta, among politicians and civil servants. It is so rife today that it verges on the ridiculous. Yet it's often claimed that it was as bad, if not worse, during National Party rule but that there was a massive cover-up. No, that's not correct. Uh, in the days of a Minister of Finance, such as the late Mr. Tlazi Havenha, he was world-renowned for his capabilities and for his, uh, for his decent way of dealing with the finances of the country. L after him, Dr. Dungeons became the Minister of Finance. It is true that in any country where you have human government, there from time to time originate corruptive practices. But the question is when you find out where the corruption takes place, whether you are prepared to deal with it. But did you people try to find out or was there a cover-up, do you think? No. No, we didn't try to cover up. Uh, we actually fought and acted against corruption when we became when it became known to us i can mention a few examples to you where eventually a cabinet minister landed in jail yes and after 50 years in politics mr berta how wealthy are you you're referring to me yes well all i can tell you is this house where we're sitting here I bought uh, from a, a, a man who lived here with his wife, and I had to take a, 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 a loan. I had to make a loan at Sambo, the then Sambo, who, who disappeared since then. And uh, I paid off monthly basis the the the. the, the the real amount that I owed them for this house. I've never become wealthy. I've never become a member of the wealthy club. 
A question frequently asked, Mr. Boerta. Via the TRC hearings and a multitude of other reports, we have heard of murders, torture, and other heinous acts by branches of the security forces during National Party rule. For example, the deeds perpetrated at Flakplas. Were you or any of your cabinet ever aware of such cruelties taking place, and if not, why? Now, let me say this. I speak now on the, uh, with the knowledge of what happened before me. The late Dr. Favut would never have given a, 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 a leave for people to, to commit uh, murders and uh, bad uh, uh, actions against uh, South African citizens. The same applies to Foster. Foster was against it. But, uh, and I differed with him on, on some occasions. But as a cabinet, even under my uh, 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 prime ministership or presidentship, I would never have granted leave for such actions. When it became known, the necessary steps were taken. What happened at the Truth Commission, uh, I can't speak f for that because um, they subpoenaed me to appear before him. I called them a circus. And it's well known that eventually I landed in court. Uh, on what, uh, because of my attitude not to appear before them. And uh, I, uh, they, they found me guilty with the necessary uh, uh, conclusions from their decision. I appealed to the Supreme Court in Cape Town and I won the case. Were those security forces thus a kind of law unto themselves, with no control from higher up? Yes, in certain cases it might have been the position. Uh, look, in a human organization, such as the police force at that stage, uh, you might get individuals who take the law into their own hands. And that is wrong, but that should be dealt with the moment you get uh, notice that some something is wrong. So you people also obviously not knowing about it you say we do not accept any responsibility for it. No, the question of responsibility is something different. You always carry the responsibility whether your, your subordinates uh, act in a correct way or not. I, for instance, accepted responsibility in the administration falling under me. So uh, you can't get away from your responsibility as a public figure. Say for instance in this case where a cabinet minister was eventually found guilty of corruptive purposes. We accepted the responsibility but we didn't side with him in the way he dealt with the matters and we didn't uh, try to protect him. The law went its course. The rule of Tabu Mbeki and Nelson Mandela, how would you compare them? It is well known that Mr. Nelson Mandela, at his own request, saw me on different occasions in Cape Town and here in wilderness. I warned him against uh, policies, dangerous policies for the country. At one stage he was sitting in this very room and he requested me to come back into politics. 
In what capacity? As leader of the National Party. Ah. And I declined. I said to him, no, I can't cooperate in that sense because I fundamentally differ the way you are dealing with matters and the way I'm dealing with matters. You know, he declined to renounce violence as a way of dealing with political life. I warned him against communism, although he stated in the court who found him guilty that he, uh, he, 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 he was quoted to, to, to describe how to be a good communist. I never liked his policies, and he knows it. Uh, I never saw him on occasion to warn against terrorism and communism. He never did so. The same applies to the President Mbeki. I never saw him warning against uh, terrorism and communism. So, both of them, in certain aspects, act the same in, a, in the same way. In his document, Nelson Mandela referred to concerns about ANC links with the East South African Communist Party and wrote, I've already pointed out that no self-respecting freedom fighter will allow the government to prescribe who his allies in the freedom struggle should be, and that to obey such instructions would be a betrayal of those who have suffered repression with us for so long. We equally reject the charge that the ANC is dominated by the SACP, and we regard the accusation as part of the smear campaign the government is waging against us. How do you view your career, the good parts and possibly the parts you regret? And what message do you have for this rainbow nation, as it is now called, particularly with regard to its future? When I look back, I feel happy about the share I had in building up the National Party. I thoroughly enjoyed it, to serve under prominent leaders of the past. And uh, after that, I became a senior member of the party. Uh, my days as Minister of Defense were some of the most lucky days in my life. And so was the development of our arms industry. Um, I look back with deep appreciation for the opportunities I had to, 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 to uh, deal with my share of commitment in the sense. Um, I was very much disappointed when I saw that the National Party dwindled away. Uh, it brought forward strong leaders in the past. Uh, but eventually, it seems to me, disappointment took control over its soul. Did you have any regrets in your life as leader? Look, I've been in public life for more than 50 years. Over such a period, 
you have your disappointments, but you have you also have your very pleasant days. And I would say that looking back, if I have to do again what I've done, I'll repeat it. And how do you see the future of the country, Mr. Berta? Any message for our rainbow nation? What must they do to remain a rainbow? Look, uh, I don't believe there's such a thing as a rainbow nation. I think it's the wrong word. Uh, to call it an absurdity, I think, would be right. The colors of the rainbow are quite different from the colors in South Africa. And in any, any other country, I don't think we, I don't agree with the, the term rainbow nation. Uh, no, we are a country of multicultural minorities. That is what we are, multicultural minorities. And we should build for the future on those principles, economic cooperation, cultural mutual respect, and dedicated service to a country you say you love. Thank <laughs> you.